So we're in our new series, 101 Bible Questions. We're not doing 101 weeks. It's not going to take two years. Uh, we're, we're skipping around. We're hitting the most important questions of all. And this week, the topic is forgiveness, which you got to say, I mean, that's a no-brainer. Forgiveness is a pretty big deal. I mean, we wear crosses around our necks. We put them on the walls of our church buildings. The meaning of the cross and what kind of forgiveness you and I have is a pretty big deal. Now, if you've already tuned out and said, oh, I know about that forgiveness. No, you don't, because I don't. I'm spending the rest of my life digging in and celebrating the fullness of what we're going to talk about today. What we're going to talk about today is radical, it's outlandish, it's ridiculous. I can't believe it's the gospel. What we're going to talk about today is that your next sin is already forgiven. So go for it. No, no. <laughs> but seriously, your next sin is already forgiven, and if it's not, then you're going to ask Jesus to die again. He's not going to die again. You've been forgiven once for all, and so what does that do to a person? When you realize how radical and crazy this message is that your next sin is already forgiven, here's what happens. You fall in love with God in a deeper way, and you say, wow, I can't believe I'm this free. I can't believe you trust me this much, and Jesus says it. He called it. He said, whoever is forgiven much loves much, and whoever's forgiven little loves little. So the message for today is not, God will forgive you if you ask. That's not the message. The message for today is not, God will forgive you if you keep confessing. That's not the message. The message is, God has forgiven you past, present, and future, no matter what. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are a totally forgiven person. Now be careful because you can now do whatever. And you could be forgiven and miserable if you're not careful. You could be forgiven and miserable. But we want you to be forgiven and content and forgiven and fulfilled. So we couple that message, total forgiveness with look at you and your new heart. That total forgiveness with look at you and your new identity, your new desires. It all fits. It's genius. It's called the gospel. God is incredible. But today we're going to drill down into our total forgiveness in Christ to understand it better. And we're going to, we're going to ask some important questions. Here they are. One, two, and three. Is asking forgiveness necessary in order to be forgiven by God? Is forgiving others, you know, like in the Lord's Prayer, is forgiving others necessary in order to be forgiven by God? And then number three is confessing your sins, making sure you remember everyone, confess everyone. Is that necessary in order to be forgiven by God? Now, it just shocks me that we are not talking about this in thousands of churches across the world. This is really important. We cannot afford to talk about the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in generic terms. We need to drill down. People need these questions answered. There are folks who have been in church for 60 years and worn crosses around their necks and looked at the cross on a wall of a church and said amen a thousand times that Jesus died for their sins, and yet they still believe that they've got to remember every sin and confess every sin and ask for forgiveness for every sin in order to get forgiven daily. But I thought you said Jesus took away your sins. But I thought you said he remembers your sins no more. But I thought you said he removed them as far as the east is from the west. So asking him to do what he's already done makes no sense. And so today... We're going to look at this, a lot of scripture talking about your forgiveness, and it ain't progressive. <laughs> look at this. First, we're going to see that they're gone. Psalm 103, you see David talking about this. The Lord, through David, prophesying about this. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It's not a cover-up. It's a takeaway. It's not a covering, it's a removal. You've heard your sins are under the blood. Don't worry, your sins are under the blood. We're saying, no, that's not right. Your sins are not under the blood. There's not a single verse that says your sins 
are under the blood. Your sins have been washed away, taken away, removed. It's greater than a covering. Your sins are not under, they're gone. And so we see in John, this is the big deal. This is why John the Baptist, I mean, look what he says. He's excited because this kind of forgiveness did not exist in the Old Testament under the law. They didn't experience it. And so he says, uh, Jesus is coming to him. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Notice that takeaway. That's the stunner. That's why the translators of this passage put a little exclamation mark here. Whoa, John is taken aback. He's shocked. This is the Lamb of God, not to cover like we're used to, you know, in the temple, in the tabernacle with the blood of bulls and goats. That was a yearly covering. It was a little by little. It was like paying off your car. You know how you pay your car off every month? You make a payment. Every month you pay your house off. You're paying your mortgage. Those are installments. That's kind of like what the Old Testament forgiveness was. It was in installments. You would go back to the Day of Atonement year after year, repeatedly, endlessly, and those sacrifices were a shadow of what Christ would do. They actually didn't do anything except symbolize what Christ has done. And so they were an annual reminder of sins it was almost like an IOU. If you had your faith in Messiah coming, this was a picture of the IOU that would be cashed in on at the cross. And so he's taken away your sins. Now, what did he do after taking them away? He sat down. And remember, no priest in the Old Testament could sit down. If you are seated right now in a chair, you have rested your weight in that chair, you're relaxed, you did a few things before. If you're sitting here today with me, or in West Texas, you've seated, you're seated there. I mean, you did a few things to get here. You got ready, you showered, I hope. I mean, you got ready, you got dressed, you got here, you drove over, you sat down, and now you're resting. Well, Jesus went to the cross, crucified, buried, raised, and now he is seated at God's right hand and he's resting about your sins. But now in the Old Testament, God would never let that happen. You don't find a single priest in the Old Testament seated in the temple or tabernacle because the work was never done. Watch this. Every priest in the Old Testament, what happened? Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time and time again the same sacrifices over and over which could never take away sins. Couldn't happen. But he, Jesus Christ, having offered, look at this, one sacrifice for sins for all time. Do you hear that? For all time. Even tomorrow's sins. For all time, what did Jesus do? He sat down at the right hand of God. He did the illegal. He did the forbidden. He did what no Old Testament priest could ever do. He sat down because the job was over. The work was finished. And so then we have to ask, what are you doing about your sins? What position are you in? Are you up running around Texas running around the world trying to get right and get forgiven and get cleansed and progressively, little by little through confession, little by little through asking, little by little through trying to make up for it? Are you trying to progressively get forgiveness or are you sitting down with Jesus Christ and agreeing with him that it's finished? What position are you in? Suffering from the Martha syndrome, Martha, 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 or are you like Mary, seated with Jesus and enjoying him? Only one of those positions is a position of faith. Faith says, sit down, Jesus did it, it's awesome, you can't add to it. Hebrews 1, it says this, When Jesus had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Isn't that cool? 
So he sat down because it's once for all. And if you haven't heard this phrase, you're not familiar with it, it is peppered all over the book of Hebrews, the idea of once for all forgiveness. It's what we believe here. It's the only kind of forgiveness that there is on the planet, actually, from God. I mean, you either have once for all forgiveness or you have no forgiveness. You're either 0% forgiven or you're 100% forgiven. Nobody in this room is 42% forgiven or 81%. It's all or nothing. Now, the phrase once for all refers to Jesus' death. He died once for how many sins? For all. For how much time? For all time. So there's a one sacrifice for all sins, for all time, and that's what this phrase is talking about. Now let's check it out. Uh, Here in Hebrews 7, we see this concept. Jesus does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices because he did this once for all when he offered up himself. So do you see the contrast? Now, I want to bring you 2,000 years later, I want to bring you to today, to the Bible Belt, because there's still a competition. There's a competition of two ideas regarding your forgiveness. In this corner, we have progressive forgiveness, folks, and you get forgiven kind of like you do with other people, you know? They'll say, well, now, come on, I mean, you want to understand God's forgiveness. Now, think about when you hurt your husband. Think about when you hurt your wife. Think about when your kids hurt you. You want them to come to you. And right there, you need to hit the pause button because you're teaching me that God's forgiveness is like my family. Ouch. Now that is going to leave a mark. (laughs) Thank God our forgiveness is not like human-to-human love. I didn't die for your sins. You didn't die for my sins. That sort of sacrifice didn't happen between husband and wife or father and and son. It didn't happen. So we can't look to human relationships to understand God's forgiveness. We have to look to Jesus. And so today in the Bible Belt, there is a competition of two ideas. Are you going to believe that you are forgiven progressively based on your apologies to God? Or are you going to believe you're forgiven once for all based on the blood of Jesus? Is it an apology-based forgiveness or is it a blood-based forgiveness? Because if it's a blood-based forgiveness, Jesus shed his blood once and he'll never do it again. And it worked the first time and it needs no repeat. So we've got to decide, back then the issue was, am I going to go offer animal sacrifices or am I going to trust Jesus? And today, we're not offering animals in our backyards, but we still got a decision. Am I going to believe this Christianity thing has offered me little by little forgiveness or has God wiped the slate clean forever no matter what? And only one of those ideas is the truth. They can't both be true. Hebrews 10, 14 gives us the answer. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Now you say, well, who who are those? I mean, I want to be sanctified. You are. (laughs) Hebrews 10, 10 says that you have been sanctified. Four verses earlier, if you're a Christian, you've been set apart. That's all that means. We've made a lot out of that word, but all it means is set apart. And if you're a child of God, you're set apart, you're sanctified, and it says about you, about every Christian in this room, it doesn't matter what you've done, you know, the lust and the pornography and the envy and the gross stuff that you're embarrassed about and the thing that happened 12 years ago and the, you you know what I'm saying, the real sins that we've committed that maybe plague our conscience What God is trying to tell us is that we can let it go because he already has. We can keep no record because he has no record. We can destroy the movie reel in our minds because he makes no reference to our wrongs. That's the truth that will set you free. You can't afford to have a different attitude than God himself. 
when you and God disagree, who's right? When he says you're forgiven and you say, well, I don't know, I need to, who's right? When he says he remembers your sins no more, what should you do? Keep no record. Agree with him. He's right about everything all the time, including your sins. That's why we see our forgiveness expressed in past tense. You'll notice this right here in in Colossians chapter 2. When you were dead, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. couple of things. Notice, when did this happen? It happened at salvation. When he made you alive, he did two things at once. Number one, he made you alive. Number two, he forgave you all your sins. It happened at salvation, and it doesn't need to happen again. Would you wake up every day, folks? Would you wake up every day and say, Lord, please make me alive? That doesn't make any sense, does it? You say you're born again. You say you're alive. You wouldn't ask God to make you alive every day. So why are you asking God if he will forgive you every day? They both happened at salvation, and we should be thanking God instead of asking God. Here's another one in past tense, 1 John chapter 2. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake, 1 John 2.12. Again, expressed like it's already happened. We don't have to make it happen if he's already done it. So I hope you're getting excited. I hope you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth because I don't believe we're hearing this enough in Christian circles today. What I'm saying is you're free from guilt. You're free from condemnation. You're totally forgiven. So now you're going to have to decide what you want to do. And it's going to surprise you. What you really want to do is going to surprise you. Some people, they think, well, if you told me I'm totally forgiven, I'm just going to go out and set a world record for sin. You've already done that. Congrats. You've already done that. You have sinned millions of times in your life, and you hate it. As a child of God, you hate it. So something's happening now. Now you're figuring something out here. It's pretty strange, but God actually likes you. And he's snuggling up. And suddenly you're clean and you're close and suddenly none of your sins shock him and you realize that he's already seen them all. He knew they were going to happen. He's not freaked out and he's already taken care of it. And so he's clean and he's close and you're clean and you're one with him and there's a vine branches relationship and it's unshakable and unbreakable. And he's trying to tell you something. We spell love, right? From parent to child, we spell love spending time with them, right? You got to spend time. Well, that's what God has done. He's cleaned house, taken up residence inside of you. He refuses to leave you. He's spending time with you all day, every day. He's trying to spell love if we can see it. And we keep asking, did I fall out of fellowship? Did I fall out of your will? Am I okay? Did I lose my salvation? Did I? We keep asking all these questions about, am I all right? And he keeps saying, I'm one with you. I'm one. You're clean and you're close. So he keeps no record. We see that he keeps no record in Hebrews chapter 8. It says, for I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. So... What about when he's uh, disciplining you? Have you ever had a life coach who keeps no record of your wrongs but trains you? See, God's discipline is training for the future, not punishment for the past. And so he keeps no record of your wrongs. He remembers your sins no more. This takes care of the final judgment. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to answer. I'm gonna have, they said... Uh, I mean, in church, they told me I was going to have to answer for every idle word. And I got like 812 idle words, at least. I'm going to have to answer for every idle word. Well, how does that jive with he keeps no record of your wrongs and he remembers your sins no more? We've got to make sense of this. 
If you're in Adam, there's condemnation. If you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. If you're in Adam, there's judgment. If you're in Christ, you're helping Jesus judge. You're judging the world and the angels. And your sins are gone. All right, so we got we to gotta answer some but what about, you know? I mean, there's some hanging chads, as they might say in Florida, right? We've got some stuff we got to cover. And the first one is the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, it says, And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, that sounds really good, and we end up memorizing it and repeating it in churches around the world. Chances are, with a planet this size, 8 billion people, that there's, I don't know, hundreds of churches at some point, maybe thousands, reciting the Lord's Prayer this morning. Now, what did Jesus say about that? He said, don't repeat the same prayers over and over again as if you think you're heard for your many words. He talked about meaningless repetition. And you know, literally there are thousands of people that repeat that prayer and don't even really recognize what they're praying. Now, let me give you an example. Here's just an excerpt from it, and it relates to forgiveness. You'll notice these two words that I've highlighted on the screen, as we. So this is praying to God, God, forgive us our debts just like we forgive other people. Now, imagine praying that to God this morning. God, I want you to look at how I've been treating others. You see it? I want you to look at how I've been treating others, and I want you to forgive me just like I've been forgiving others. Woo! Holy smokes, folks. That is going to hurt. And that's the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount, remember? Oh, you think you're doing good? Yeah, but you're bragging on your praying. Hide your praying. You're bragging on your fasting. Hide your fasting. You're bragging on your giving of money. Hide your giving. You're a hypocrite. And you want to pray? I'll show you how to pray. Lord, forgive me just like I've forgiven others. And they all go, oh, and they got that little gulp in their throat. And it's starting to register. He's right about me. I am a hypocrite. So what are we doing 2,000 years later reciting this and maybe not even clearing it up? And if you're not sure that that's what this means, hang on. Let's just keep reading Matthew 6. Here it is. I don't even have to interpret it. Jesus did. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, is that the gospel? Did Billy Graham stand up in stadiums around the world and tell people, you want to be forgiven, then go forgive others first? Is that the gospel? No, it is not. This is not the gospel. This is Jesus showing them their inability to keep the law. Jesus showing them the true spirit of the law. And Jesus convicting them of being a bunch of hypocrites, a brood of vipers. Are you going to buy into a viper theology? Or are you going to consider that maybe, get this, maybe, just maybe... God doesn't forgive us because we're nice. God forgives us because Jesus died. God doesn't forgive us because we forgive others. God forgives us because the blood of Jesus was shed for our sins to take them away forever. In fact, we can see the polar opposite of this in the New Testament. Look, Colossians 3.13, does it say, forgive others so God will forgive you? No, it says the opposite. Look at it. Forgiving each other just as the Lord forgave you, past tense. says the opposite of the Lord's Prayer. Let that sink in. Because the Lord's Prayer occurred before the cross, before the resurrection, before the shed blood of Jesus, and the audience is Jewish, and in the same sermon, get this, the same sermon, he says you'll be answerable to the Sanhedrin. Now, who are the Sanhedrin? A Jewish council from 2,000 years ago. Are you answerable to the Sanhedrin? (laughs) 
And he says, get right with your brother before offering your animal sacrifice. Are you offering animal sacrifice? Who's his audience? They're Jews living under the law, before the cross. We've got to consider context. Are you tired of people teaching the Sermon on the Mount as a sweet passage for Christian growth? Telling you, come on, you can do it? That is not the truth. You can't do it. And the quicker we come to that realization, we will see that the, the Sermon on the Mount is a knife. It is sharp. And it is exposing the hypocrisy of anybody trying to live under the law. And then, at the end of the sermon, he says, Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. And bam, you will have a whole new covenant of God's grace. But he's got to show you the law doesn't work before he shows you grace is the only way. I'm the way, he says. I'm the truth. I'm the life. You want forgiveness, it's through me, not through being nice. Imagine if you only got forgiven if you were nice. That's what this verse is all about in the Lord's Prayer. He's asking them, imagine if you only got forgiven because you're nice. Then what? So, not only does Colossians 3 say the opposite, but we see the opposite of the Lord's Prayer in Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Past tense. Which came first, chicken or the egg? I'm allergic to chicken. So, which came first, the cart or the horse? Right? Do you see what he's saying? God's forgiveness of you came first. Now, pass it on to other people. Have you got it? You've got it. God gave it to you. You've got it. Now, pass it on to other people. What's the Lord's Prayer say? Oh, you want it? Well, you better forgive first. What's the Gospel say? You've got it. Now, pass it on. All right, so here's one, another hanging chad, another opportunity for a but what about and this is our final but what about of the day. It's a biggie, though. It's 1 John 1, 9. You know, the bar of soap that so many have taught as the way to get forgiven and cleansed daily. But we know better than that. We just read in the book of Hebrews, we're forgiven once for all. So what in the world could 1 John 1, 9 mean? Here's an idea. Let's look at 1 John 1, 8. Here's another idea. Let's look at 1 John 1, 10. Let's look at context and see if we can deduce what's up here. On this screen, you got a 1 John 1, 9 sandwich, if you will. Verse 9 is in the middle. Now look at what it says. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I do want to say there's not another verse in the New Testament like this. You can't go to Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, or any other place to find like a formula for daily forgiveness. It's not there. This is unique. It's standalone. So what does it mean? If you're already forgiven, then why does this sound like you need to confess to get forgiven? Well, look at verse 8. Who's the audience? If we say that we have no sin. All right, that's a sin denier. What does it say? The truth is not in us. Then look at verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, it says his word is not in us. So, you know, I like to demonstrate it by saying, you know, imagine I, I got a friend, his name's Bruce, and I invite Bruce up here to stand with me. I want to tell you a little bit about my buddy Bruce. Now, my buddy Bruce says that uh, he says he's never sinned a day in his life. What do you think of that? I mean, he's making God a liar right? Bruce, he says he has no sin, that he's never sinned, and the word is not in him, and the truth is not in him, and he's making God into a liar. Now, would you conclude that Bruce is a Christian? No way, man. What's step one to becoming a Christian? Lord Jesus Christ, I am a sinner. Bruce won't say that. He's not willing to. He says he has no sin. He says he's never sinned. So I turn to Bruce. I say, look, buddy, first of all, you're nuts. 
But second of all, listen, if we, any one of us, I don't care who we are, if we, any one of us, say that we have no sin, I mean, that's a lie. If we say we've never sinned, that's crazy talk, Bruce. But if we will just come to our senses and agree with God, and if we'll just confess our sins and say, Lord Jesus Christ, I am a sinner, guess what he'll do, Bruce? He will forgive you and cleanse you of how much? All. Oh, now that sounds familiar. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? So Bruce says, you know, Andrew, I've been denying my sinfulness my whole life. I've been making excuses for it. I've been belittling it. I've been acting like it wasn't a big deal. I've been, you know, I've been kind of shoving it under. But now that you say, I mean, now that you put it that way, that I can be forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness, I'm in. I admit I'm a sinner. And that day, right there, Bruce calls upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And what happens to him? He's forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness, past, present, future, once for all. What have we done? Hello. You can look at 5,000 curriculums and books and publications on forgiveness. And we have taken this verse out of context as a bar of soap for daily forgiveness for Christians. And it is evangelistic. And it is written to sin deniers. And it offers once for all forgiveness for anybody that will admit their need for Jesus Christ. It is not a daily forgiveness. We have a once for all forgiveness in Jesus. So what does this mean then? I hope you've put the pieces together today. Jesus sat down. It is finished. You're a totally forgiven person once for all. He didn't leave any sin out. He keeps no record of your wrongs. It's over. It's done. So now, what about Jesus when he comes back? You know, because I'm afraid of that movie. You know, that big movie screen in the sky with all my sins on it. Have you thought about that? Of course you have. It's not in the scripture, but we've all sort of gotten this image of us watching a movie. Now look at what Hebrews 9 says. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, look at this, will appear a second time, for what reason? For salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. He's coming back, but it's for one reason, for salvation for you. And what's he going to say about your sins? He's not even going to refer to them. Do you see that? Is that not incredibly powerful? He will return without reference to your sins. Why? Because he took them away and he remembers them no more. So let's thank our God. Father, we are so grateful for this forgiveness. We can't ask for it anymore. We've got it. So we're just going to say thank you. We can't hope for it, beg for it, plead for it. We're just going to say thank you because it is finished. We love you, Jesus. We are so grateful for, for your work on the cross, your blood shed for us once for all. All we can do is just give a big wow and thank you. In Jesus' name we do it. Amen.